a beautiful family bit of a random unexpected video coming from the middle of the night you should be able to hear the background chorus and the morning prayer starting it's about 4 30 in the morning you hear the mosque calling for morning prayer behind me by the way is a beautiful painting i received on my birthday which was the 30th of march and it depicts the Lion of Judah. It was done by a local artist at Fritzy's request and it's just so stunning. I thought I'd try and get that in there. I may set up a studio with this in the background, I think. I've been doing a lot of soul searching, fasting and prayer the last two months, in particular the last seven weeks or so. Certainly coincided with catching a a virus with my family and it, it, it hitting me pretty hard but during that process I have taken a Nazarite vow and I haven't taken one for a long time and I thought I'd talk about that for those who don't know what it is and the significance and why I do it the most famous Nazarite was Samson and Samson took the Nazarite vow and his vow was that he would not drink anything or eat anything from the vines or drinking alcohol he would not cut his hair and he would not touch a dead body but the dead body depicted if you look into it in the Nazarites it was not incorporating animals so it didn't mean he had to be vegetarian and the reason for that was back then they didn't believe an animal had a complete soul so it wasn't categorized by the Nazarites as a fully dead body. That's why Samson, for those who know the story, was able to defeat uh, uh, with the jaw of a donkey an army on his own. He was touching part of a dead animal to do that. So why do I take it? Well, first of all, I never drink alcohol. I think it's a fool's bargain to take the stuff. It gives you some temporary pleasure, but cuts you off from the, in my experience, the eternal elongated peace that God brings and the serendipity that that brings to your life as well. Cutting my hair, I only did recently. I did not cut my hair for around about six years. And many of you knew it was very long, it was down here. And by the grace of God, I shan't be around any dead bodies. But the hair thing, I'll get onto, but I want to get on quick with the vine thing. You have to look at the vine in a more sensible way than just saying, I'm not going to eat grapes and drink alcohol made from them. What are the vines of life that are going to separate you from your relationship with God? And eating from the vines are distractions and entertainments I've made a very strong conscious push I've made rooms in my house uh, you're not allowed to have a mobile phone there I have made a, a concerted effort to absolutely reduce my technology time and spend more time in prayer and fasting this is not eating from the vines of life this is segregating from it I mentioned in my recent video, solitude, solitude deprivation is a huge problem. Any vine that takes you away from that, takes you away from the solitude of being alone with God, that's eating from the vine and those are the vines you need to sever. You can't just sit there watching movies all night and playing games and say, I'm not eating grapes, I'm doing it. You've got to cut away from the vines that cut you away from the Father. Now I'm not cutting your hair is the next one. And that has to include, for men, your facial hair as well. When I do a Nazarite vow, it's for a, not a predetermined length. I let God end things. Today, a friend of mine who's fasting contacted me. And he said, when do you end your fasts? And I said, when God tells me. And I gave an anecdote that last year I was quite... It was struggling. July, I caught a virus as well, many of you know. And I said to God, I feel very weak, but I'm going to fast on only water. And I'll let you tell me when it's time to stop. Because I have that much trust. 
I have that much trust in God. I know he's there and I know he'll come. I know he'll let me know if there's a problem. I literally walk that way. I will be happy to keep going up to 40 days if he doesn't give me that sign. I hand it over to him. On the seventh day, I woke up and I was astonished. I had never had a notification on my mobile phone from Kindle. I have the Kindle app there, so sometimes I can read a book. Uh, actually, the last one I read, I'm going to make a video about the Colburn Bible, a very beautiful piece of literature. And I've never had an advert from them, ever. Not one time, no notification. And that morning I woke up and I said to Fritzy, look, I have to break my fast. And she said, how do you know? And Kindle had recommended me a book and it was not a new book. And it was called Time to Eat. <laughs> and it was there on the home screen of my phone. Kindle book recommendation, Time to Eat. So I knew it was time to eat and I broke my fast. This is how you can live with God. You can lay down your fleece as it says in the Bible. He lays down a fleece and he says, if the ground is wet and the fleece is dry, I know this is what you want. And I do that often too. So you can do that, you can hand it over to God. So, I don't know how long it will last, but I won't be cutting my hair dealing with my beard. And one of the immediate things that does for me, it really disconnects me from the societal oppression of how we should look. The societal oppression of you should dress this way. Now living between Africa and Europe, Fritzi and I have experienced this. There was a time we were using a lot of our clothing to deal with the dogs and we had some problems with rats and they hit our clothes, etc. And we wore clothes here with holes in them. Many people here wear clothes with holes in them. Those who start earning a little more money develop a societal ego, they develop self-consciousness and they develop a concern of other people judging them. And, and so they start worrying and not wanting to do that. We, however, had many around us in poverty and we could see many were wearing clothes with rips, etc. And we were happy to do the same. It didn't bother us, so we did. When we got back to Europe wearing the same clothes, we felt it, we felt awkward, we felt we needed to buy new clothes, we felt this is not acceptable in this culture. This is the birthplace of a societal ego. It's a collective ideology and it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's not a bad thing that we know it's not okay to walk around nude on the streets of Europe, etc. This is good for our children, it's good for our loved ones. It's not always a, a negative. We're just living in this beautiful world. Sha la 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 la. We're just living in this beautiful world. It's time for fire. Smoke and leaves, the only mosquito repellent we need. Pay respect to the north, the south, the west, and the east. Pay respect to the spirit of this old country. Freedom in the hearts of the young and brave who know little of the journey of the diggers who gave their lives to the service and the government gained so that we could dance together on this beautiful day. And now everybody smiles in the setting sun and sighs with contentment when the day is done. Hand in hand with the one you love, feeling blessed by the magic of the moon above and the same. Sha la 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 We're just living in this beautiful world Sha la 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 We're just living in this beautiful world
But this is an example of that existing as a personality within you, and personality derived from persona in Greek, which means mask. So when I move around and I cater for my self-image, and I worry about, is my beard trimmed well, is my hair cut, etc. There's a part of you there which is blemished by the world because you are letting the world determine and dictate to you something as much as your appearance. Now, it doesn't mean you don't take care of your appearance sometimes because we have a society and we want to be respected and understood. And if you walk around looking a certain way, people, they will react to you and not respond to you. I wrote a post on my Instagram today about an albino child in our care manual. And I said, he's such a loving boy, he's inquisitive, and I think he might be an engineer, he loves hugs. But then I said, how many people, when they first look at that picture and see an albino child in our care, think, who is this child? What does he like? What does he like to do? What are his dreams? Who does he take after? No one, most react and say, there's an albino child, he has a disability and he's in a country where he's in great danger. Those two narratives come to mind. But in having those narratives, often the responding to the inner child is, is gone. And likewise, we do that with one another. But when you enter a Nazarite vow, you're basically saying to that, I give no thought to it. You're saying to society, I give no thought to your rules about what I should look like. In the same way, a tree does not stop its natural image. A tree bends left, right, up, down. It does whatever it can to reach the light. And when you go into a forest, you don't judge which trees are going in which direction, you accept them. When a man leaves himself in a Nazarite vow and his facial hair comes, his long hair comes, this is how God intended him to look. And depending which culture you're in is how you will try to mold that natural version of who you are to suit the culture. And so I find the Nazarite vow is merely that, accepting that natural presence will take over my image and how I look, accepting that I'm cutting away from the vines of the world that are distracting me from, from God in prayer. And hopefully I will be staying away from the dead body, but also I'll stay away from the dead in conscious, the dead in consciousness, those who are living in the lower states, I, I don't need to be around them in those times where I need to remain high. I will not spend time with gluttons and drunkards, as Jesus said. And when I take that vow, this is what it's about. And there's something liberating about saying that on a spiritual level, saying that I let go of my image conforming to the belief of society around me. And I leave it to grow naturally, knowing that there is no judgment from God in how I look. There'll be no judgment from my family. My wife may not like it quietly. But this is all in the pursuit of an openness and an awareness and an acceptance of simply growing like a tree out of the nature around you. And in the same way, so too a man can grow. Samson was a Nazarite. And he took the Nazarite vow. And in my experience, when you take the vow and you partake in the, the abolition of the influence of society on your appearance, on the vines that connect you to the world, whatever they may, may be personally to you, when you take that vow with God, what you start to do is sever away from all of the beastly, fleshly impulses within you. Anything that the flesh can influence you to do to pull you away from God. And Samson famously wrestled a lion with his bare hands. And just as the Minotaur was in a maze and you had to get through there without it wiping you out, the Minotaur was a representation of that beastly, lower fleshly nature. And I've covered the lions of Christianity in another video, but on one level of the deep understanding of Christian parable, the lion 
is the ravenous lower nature. And the only way that you can overpower that lower nature is by separating yourself from the vines of the world and by releasing within you the strength to overcome that beast. You don't overcome it with fighting and malice. You, you overcome it with gentleness by trying to find it within you, by trying to find the home of the lion within you is your ego. And when you try to look for that, when you try to bring that out of yourself and look at it and put it in your hands and show it to the world, you find out that it's a concept you're looking for. It's all mental illusion. And that's how you wrestle the lie and that's how you beat it. When you have the impulses coming from your body to be sexually immoral, to be gluttonous, whatever it may, whatever form it may take, that's the lion picking a fight with you and you've got to put it down just as Samson did. And I find the Nazarite vow really separates me from that part of myself and gives me much more space with God, much, much more space with God. And of course, we all know what happened to Samson. Delilah cut his hair. She deceived him and she used his carnality. She used those impulses I just spoke of against him. And that was where his power left him for a while. And not only did his power leave him, but he lost his eyes. He lost his own sight. He was blind to the world. Just as Jesus healed the blind man. And how did he heal the blind man? He spat at the earth. Spitting is a sign of contempt. He showed contempt for the lowest level of consciousness inside humanity, the earth level. Earth, water, air, fire. Beta, alpha, theta, delta. He spat at the dirt. He made earth and covered the man's eyes. Just to signify again, you're blind. Because you're at the earth level of consciousness. You're blind to the Father. But when he then took him with water and washed it away, he brought him up to that next level of consciousness, which is found only by avoiding solitude, solitude deprivation and rising up into that next level, Alpha. This is the state of us in prayer. This is why we have to fast, etc. So Samson was brought down by his carnality. Jesus healed the blind man by raising him out of the earth level. This is basically what that expresses and shows on that level written in a certain way for a certain purpose and that's why I sometimes partake in a Nazarite vow and that's why I currently am partaking in a Nazarite vow God bless guys <laughs>